Listen. Listen for a moment. Every breath, every heartbeat, every moment is a step into the future. It is a step into the future that is uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen. Even professional futurists don't know what's going to happen. And yet, we must act. We have to act knowing that our actions will have enormous repercussions for months, years, generations to come. We have to act without knowing what's going to happen. And so what we do is we build up models, build up ideas of what the future will hold. So these days, given everything that's going on, there's really one story that's being told about the future. Doom. <laughs> You know, it's really easy to think that we're doomed. I mean, look at the stuff that we're dealing with. The issues around carbon and how uh, much of it is building up. What that means for temperatures, both here and abroad. What it means for what it does to the weather. This is actually midday in Beijing. You know, that's not all of that is coal pollution, but a lot of it is. And here's the, the horrible irony that when we reduce the amount of particulate matter in the atmosphere, improving the air, making it easier and better for us to breathe, we're actually accelerating global warming because we're reducing the amount of stuff that amount of sunlight that reflects back. But global warming doesn't just mean temperatures, doesn't just you know, affect the atmosphere, it changes global conditions. So issues around the pandemic and what it means for disease, what it means for our, our, the global biology. It affects our economy. There are issues around energy that we're worried about. When we think of the doom of the, of the decades to come, you know, energy obviously plays into it. War. Overpopulation. It's actually a picture I took of Tokyo a couple years ago. Tokyo is a, in the, the city uh, Metropolitan, metropolitan area actually has a population roughly equivalent to California. And of course, refugees, all of the, the social and cultural um, side effects of all of these changes that happen. So it's very easy to think about the world being doomed. So with that, I'd like to thank you and I'll see you guys later. <laughs> um, it's very easy to think about the world being doomed because we don't have good models for what success looks like. We've been trained in many ways to think only of bad outcomes. We don't have a lot of opportunities to imagine in a structured, in a detailed, in a nuanced way about what it means to be successful. So what I'd actually like to do tonight is talk about scenarios of sustainability. Now, scenarios. This is actually kind of a bit, sounds like a bit of a jargon term. What it means is I'm going to construct, I'm going to describe three different narratives of what the next 50 years could hold. Three different stories. Now, they aren't predictions. That's one thing that uh, the world of foresight, the world of futurism has, one way it's changed over the past few decades. We've moved away from the idea of making predictions, making a bold pronouncement about what will happen. Anyone who gives you a single bold pronouncement about what will happen is probably trying to, t to sell you something. I have nothing to sell. So what I'd like to do is describe three different futures. I've given them names because that's a nice way to remember them. But what's really important about these three alternative futures is that this isn't a good, better, best, or this isn't a good, good middling, worse. These are three different kinds of worlds. And the futures that they hold, the stories that they tell, derive from different kinds of issues. Um, the first one, walking the tightrope, is a story of politics, global politics allowing us to create a, world, a sustainable world that is in many respects kind of the um, conventional wisdom view of what sustainability would look like. It's the one that, that demands the least from you in terms of changes to your lifestyle and demands the most from you from the changes to your society. The second one, flux capacity, is more of a disaster recovery story 
and it looks at what happens as community becomes the key driver for sustainability, as our social networks from the bottom up help us to recreate the world, the economy, the, you know, the technology, the society that we have around us in a way that's more sustainable. And the last one, catalytic conversions, is a story of technology. What happens when sustainability, a sustainable, tr truly successfully sustainable future, comes from innovation, invention, and experimentation. Now, what's really important about these three is that they aren't just wild, you know, wild guesses as to what the future could hold. Um, they aren't just imaginary tales that I pulled out of a science fiction magazine. These three scenarios are based upon observations that I make. Now, what I do as a futurist, what I do as a foresight specialist, is I watch the world around me, and I look for ways in which seemingly disparate areas are connected. Different dynamics that seem to have nothing to do with each other actually weave together. Uh, the, the joke that I, that I like to make is that um, I'm perfect for this job because I'm an easily distracted generalist. And that's really, it's actually more, more serious than not because what I try to do is I never let myself get too focused on any one thing. I'm looking for the connections. I'm looking for the signals, the distant early warnings that tell us what might happen. And all three of these scenarios, none of these should be considered to be the, the written in stone future. These are, these are illustrations, implications of the present day activities. So what I'm going to do with each of these is actually give you, run down some of the signals, some of the things I'm looking at, but also describe what this distant 50-year future could look like. Um, but a first, a word on what I'm trying to do with all this. Futurism is a vaccination. Futurism is, is a way not to um, know what's going to happen, but to prepare yourself for what might happen. Think about the way a vaccination works. Our bodies, if we encounter a, path, a natural pathogen, we generate antibodies. So if we encounter that pathogen, again, we're better prepared. Vaccination jumpstarts that process so that if we ever encounter a particular pathogen, the body is ready. We become sensitized to a particular threat. In a similar way, what futurism does, what foresight does, is it sensitizes us to different changes so that things that we otherwise might have ignored, things we otherwise might have dismissed as unimportant, suddenly become meaningful. We suddenly start paying attention to the world in a different way because we're thinking not just about what's happening now, but how what happens now evolves and rolls and emerges into the next year, decade, generation. So let's start with walking the tightrope. You know, here's, we, this is where design is really focused on efficiency, it's a top-down leadership, and that political top-down leadership is the critical element here. Um, there's an emphasis on transparency in society, but not in the kind of um, WikiLeaks manner. This is transparency where everything is known about you. Everything is known about you, including your energy footprints, carbon footprints, et cetera, because that's, a way, that's the way we keep things under control. Regulated economics, adaptive technology. This is not the high-tech future. This is the sustainable, stable future. Now, we imagine this would be something run by the UN, and you know, maybe the, the really nice version of this is. But more likely, it's run by something like this. This is actually a photograph I took last year in Astana, Kazakhstan at the, no, the Astana Economic Forum. And around that table, a variety of Nobel Prize economists and corporate leaders and government leaders, and Tony Blair is visible on screen there, um, talking about the state of the global economy. You know, wondering why Greece hadn't been kicked out of the EU yet, and how awful it was that Americans got to vote for the president because the president's so powerful and we end up with people like Obama. And basically, trying to decide what will happen to the global economy. And these are people who have, in many, in many ways, the power to decide that. And that's the kind of leadership we're likely to see in this heavily top-down political control future, sustainable future. It's a world of observation. You know, transparency where everyone, can, where the system knows what you're doing. Again, real photograph, I love the fact that George Orwell Plaza is covered with surveillance cameras. 
But it's a world of, of efficiency. It's a, it's a world where we're doing everything we can to reduce our footprint, everything we can to maximize what we can do, the, the amount of activity, the amount of work that we can do with a, with a decreasing amount of energy, with a decreasing amount of carbon. You know, things like plug-in hybrid. This is actually my plug-in hybrid. These kinds of technologies are indicators that we have these mechanisms in place, these systems underway that allow us to reduce our footprint. Not in a dramatic, revolutionary way, but in a little by little, piece by piece, bit by bit, moment by moment way. And over time, under this kind of scenario, these add up and make a difference. You know, the kinds of technologies that we see are the kinds that maximize efficiency, maximize the, um, our ability to get work done at a minimal cost. And we think, okay, remote controlled equipment, there are lots of those out there, and lots of increasing variety of things that will let us do more and more. Um, you know, heck, the Curiosity rover on Mars is ultimately a piece of remote control equipment. But the kind of remote control equipment that you're most likely to see on a regular basis, something closer to this. Always watching. Always making sure. Now, those of you who are in this who are in this field may recognize that simply, you know, simply using plug-in hybrids and more you know, more efficient forms of, of work, that's not going to get you to the kind of sustainable future that we want. So this is a future that that is likely to rely heavily on geoengineering, ways of controlling global temperatures in order to essentially slow, slow the catastrophe, giving us more time to act. If this is a happy future for some of you, that's actually a good thing, because what this means, this is a future that, as much as it may seem kind of oppressive, is also a future where everything is under control. Things are being handled. So what does this look like as we move out 50 years? This is very much a future where um, all of our activities are watched, and we're aware of that, and we're okay with that because we have a survivable planet. All of our choices are recorded, but more to the point, all of our choices are determined by an educational system that makes it very clear that, that the implications, the results of our actions matter. This is a world where politics matters because we all, um, we ultimately have to have a say. We ultimately have to have a voice in what's going on here. And in this kind of world, it's easy to let other people have our voice. So again, three different futures. Let's take the one that's more about community, the more bottom-up version, flux capacity. Here the design principle is more about resilience, less about efficiency, more about flexibility. Um, this is a recovery after crisis scenario. This is the one about things have actually started to get bad, so how do we deal with that and take what looks to be a potential disaster and turn that into a sustainable future? This is a world where um, many of the political and social institutions that we're familiar with today are being transformed. Not because um, we're just bored with them, but because they no longer work. We recognize that the catastrophe that we got into, or the disaster that we were heading towards, was in many respects derived from the kinds of political and social institutions that we'd already that we'd had built up. This is a world that heavily, heavily relies on maker technology. This is not hippie nirvana. This is a world where, the phrase that, that somebody tossed at me about this was cyber Amish. You know, it's a very, you know, the Amish are not Luddites. The, other, the Amish are not people who just refuse to adapt technology. They're actually very, very careful about which technologies they adapt. And it's this, that's this kind of world, careful technologies. This is actually a photograph that um, is from my grandfather's collection from World War II. It was uh, the company Chaplin was taking photographs around Europe. And I love this picture because this is at the waning days of the war. And it shows the brutal normality of life in the midst of catastrophe. You know, the city's been, the city's been bombed out. All of their their infrastructure has been damaged, and they still need to do the laundry. This is the normality of life under crisis. And it's this kind of thing you've got to remember. When we think about the potential for catastrophe, the potential for disaster, we have to remember that it's in the context of needing to go on and live your life. 
So a lot of the kinds of developments that you see in this world are about figuring out ways to have a normal life amidst what was potentially a world-ending catastrophe. This is one where you have a lot of bottom-up development in terms of where politics comes from community organization. It's a world where politics and society are networked. Now, this is a, this is a great picture from actually provided by Facebook a couple of years ago. This, the, the, all of the social connections, all the friend connections on Facebook. It's interesting to see where Facebook is and is not active. Um, the big blank area in Brazil is actually because um, Brazil is the one place where Orkut, Google's social network, took off. You see China's missing, Russia's missing. But the point is that this is the kind of world that takes advantage of these kinds of social technologies, takes advantage of these mechanisms for making connections and learning from each other. There's a guy named John Robb, who's a really interesting military theorist of all things, who talks about open source warfare. But the idea here is that people who are doing this kind of bottom-up guerrilla insurgency can share ideas now that we have the advent of these kinds of technologies. And that same idea applies to the people who are doing the bottom-up guerrilla insurgencies to change society for the better. This is a rooftop garden in Brooklyn. You know, the idea here is, again, you're trying to adapt a system that isn't rich anymore, a system that isn't doing all too well, but you do what you can with what you have. And you play with some interesting innovations. This is, I love this one. This is actually, there are a couple of different companies that are working on sails and kites for shipping boats, shipping ships, uh, basically increasing the energy, the fuel efficiency of shipping vessels through the use of wind power. And it seems so old fashioned. And yet it works really well. I think it's something along the lines of a 10 to 25% improvement in, fu in fuel efficiency. You know, really dramatic change. So it's not just trying to live a hard scrabble existence. It's actually trying out some innovation. And as that 50-year period progresses, you actually start to have the opportunity to try some really interesting innovations. You know, changes, complete changes to how our transportation systems work. But I mentioned early on that the, this economy is a maker economy. What I'm talking about are things like this. This is a 3D printer. How many of you here are familiar with 3D printers? Just sort of, yeah, about, about half of you. Um, these are systems, and these are real systems, that are able to print out physical objects, um, increasingly usable physical objects. And as these systems become more sophisticated, as the materials that can be used in the printouts become more powerful, you ultimately move towards a system where you can make whatever you need by sending a printer file to it. And these kinds of things are real now and only becoming more and more powerful. And what these do is these democratize manufacturing. These distribute the ability to make things, moving us away from the traditional top-down model of factories and making things, and towards the potential for something that in many respects seems like the old style you know, journeyman and apprentice, you know, regional shop models, town shop models, but it's something very, very different because it allows anybody to have the potential to make something approaching over time, anything. This is something where biofuels end up being really important. But when we talk about the making of things, does anyone know what this is? I'm curious. This, this is meat, um, as in what, you, what would eventually go into a hamburger. There is a process known as, or technology known as, um, um, cultured meat, synthetic meat, that takes actual muscle from an animal and grows it in a particular kind of, of environment, allowing it to reproduce and turn into something akin to the kind of material that you then toss into a grinder to turn into a burger without actually killing anything. And because you have a real precise control over it, you, it doesn't require anything in, or much in the way of energy. It doesn't require you to be tearing up the, the land for corn to feed cattle because the cattle all live in petri dishes. It's the potential for ethical meat to the point where actually PETA has put up money to fund some of this research. You know, in creating meat that is, that is friendly to vegetarians. And I suspect that most of you in this audience are looking at this going, I'm not going to eat that. 
But don't look at it what it is today. Think about how that changes over time. Think about that arc of evolution. And something that looks kind of gross today ends up being completely competitive with the traditional uh, meat system over the course of the next decade or two. And by the time we're talking towards the end of that 50-year period, it's actually the preferred way of getting protein because it's much more environmentally sustainable. It doesn't require you to kill things. And it's actually the kind of, people often ask me, what, what, you know, later in the century will we look back on today and be, you know, wonder, what, how could we have done something like that? I suspect that the consumption of meat will be something that in 50 or 100 years we'll look back on today and go, how could you do that the same way we look back on um, slavery? and think, how could, they, how could people do that to other people? And that may sound a little ridiculous now, maybe. But at the same time, it's the kind of thing that is enabled by the transformation of technology, economics, and society that allows us to do things that um, let our empathy, our empathy for other living things, take on a greater role in our decision making. So what does this look like in 50 years? This is a world that is probably, in many respects, more, more sustainable over the long run than the first one, because it actually started from a, you know, that near catastrophe, actually reduced the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere to begin with. Um, this is a world that is growing very slowly. The population is probably lower than today. But it's a world that has a much greater sense of how to get things done without having an impact. There's no geoengineering necessary in this kind of world because this is a world that's very conscious of what our actions as individuals and as communities do to the planet and to each other. So the last one, catalytic conversions. This is the scary technology story. Design principle is experimentation. Politics are very disruptive. This is not a world of the UN and in the nation state as we know it. This is a world where things have really started to fall apart. Or more to the point, things have really started to transform in ways that for the, the previous institutions of power, for the organizations and individuals and governments that had once held power, it feels like things are falling apart. But for the new movements coming up, for the new, in, the new institutions coming up, it feels like we're finally having a chance to do something that's meaningful in this century. We're getting rid of and we basically have an, a legacy 19th century political economy in the West. And we're getting rid of that in this scenario. We're moving on to something fundamentally different. So economics of restoration, technologies of transformation. This is Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion map from 1943. And it's funny sometimes to think about something being 70 years old and still being you know, ahead of its time you know, today. But this notion is moving away from the traditional globe view, where the north is on top, south is on the bottom, and that's the way it's going to be, um, towards something that lets us see the world in terms of connections, lets us see the world in terms of the unity of the geography. This helps us to, to really start to think about what it's like in a world where the politics, the traditional politics of the nation state, the, you know, with, you know, the Westphalian model, no longer apply. This is a world of experimentation, where you have things like, this is actually a Japanese designer idea for what could be turned in, what could be done with the city of Taipei. You know, introducing all sorts of biologically derived architecture. There's a, um, a British scientist named Rachel Armstrong who does some really remarkable work integrating biotechnology, bioscience, and architecture, really asking the question, how do you transform the urban environment Without, when you're not just trying to replace one building with something that's actually a little bit, just a little bit nicer. You're trying to utterly transform how we live. So a building like this becomes not just a, a source of shelter or a place to do business, it becomes a source of energy. The building becomes, potentially with something like this, a net consumer of carbon. Where the building itself, because it's producing its own energy through solar, because it's, it's consuming carbon, actually becomes, has a negative footprint. And in this kind of world, the negative footprint is a good thing, because you're actively starting to pull down the carbon, actively trying to transform things back to the equilibrium that we once had. 
And these kinds of technologies not are, thing, are not things you can go down to, to Best Buy and pick up right now or you know, call up on Amazon. But they're the kinds of things that are being worked on, the kinds of things that pro where prototypes are often in laboratories around the world. And this is actually one thing that's really important about this kind of, this kind of future is that this is not just a Western future. This is, not just, this is not a future where the U.S. is in charge or Europe is in charge. This is a future that's going to be created by India, a future that's going to be created by China, a future that's going to be created by Brazil, along with the U.S. and Europe and, and the like, because this is a world where knowledge is key, where ideas and a willingness to experiment absolutely fundamental. And this is a world where not being ahead is a good thing because you can leapfrog, because you can try something new. This is a world where people, communities, societies embrace experimentation. This is a world where the economy is completely transformed. People are actually, you have fewer and fewer people actually having day-to-day -day jobs and more and more people as the 50 years goes on relying on something akin to a basic income guarantee, a basic amount of money that they get just for being alive, which sounds, is not socialism. Well, it's, it's actually something completely different. What this does is it breaks us from the traditional labor process, which sounds kind of weird, and you know, how can you do that? When you, but it makes sense when you couple it with the, with the remarkable transformations happening in terms of digital and mechanized labor. You know, you, most of you probably have heard about Foxconn, the company that makes eye devices, recently uh, deciding to purchase a million industrial robots because industrial robots don't jump off of the roof. Um, and this is you know, just a tiny indication of where things are going. And yes, yes, we're all accustomed to the idea of, of mechanization moving into manufacturing. But increasingly, we're seeing this kind of mechanization, this kind of digitization, this kind of replacement of human work with machine work happening across a, very, a, a fairly surprising spectrum of, of workplaces. You have an increasing number of surgeries done, at least in part, by machines. You have um, digital education systems taking on the role of professors. And in fact, it's a kind of a world where actually a lot of the, the work that remains vital and critical are the kinds of high-touch, person-to-person work that historically is done by women. I, mean, I wrote a piece a while ago thinking about, is this the pink-collar future? This is a world where materials can do magical things. This is actually graphene, a new derivation of, of carbon, um, which... Up until recently, the best way to make it was to use a commercial CD burner that you'd have like in your, in your PC at home. You use the laser on that to create this very, very thin layer of carbon that actually has a remarkable capacity for energy storage and energy transfer. It's, it's really kind of, kind of scary what it can do, and it's something that is being turned into marketable uses now. And it's the kind of thing that transforms the nature of batteries, transforms the nature of how we transmit and capture power. It transforms the nature of things that we would consider to be the muscles in a robot. This is a mock-up of what a molecular nanofabricator could look like. So you take that idea of a 3D printer, and it's something that you can make things with, and then you scale that down to the molecular level, where you're actually assembling things molecule by molecule, atom by atom. The precision that comes from that allows you to do really amazing stuff to create extraordinarily powerful and extraordinarily lightweight devices. And yes, it's science fiction a bit, but at the same time, there are quite a few engineers working on early, early versions of this. This is very much the kind of thing that would, should not be surprising to see over the course of the next few decades. The ability to literally make anything, most likely by pulling carbon out of the atmosphere as your source material. So, so think about that for a second. What does that mean to the world if suddenly the stuff that we make everything out of is the stuff that's poisoning the air, the stuff that we need to get rid of? This is a, this is a future that's heavily invested in figuring out how our brains work, figuring out how our bodies work, to do remarkable things with this kind of technology to, to allow us to adapt, to allow us to better understand how to create a society of 
however many billions of people, that can live with a sustainable planet and a longer-term perspective. This is the, the Google Glass technology that, that Google's trying to push. And you know, it's interesting, but it's actually indicative of the direction things are going in terms of observation. You know, I talked about in the very first scenario, I talked about the transparency being very much a top-down phenomenon. In this scenario, there's a lot of transparency, but it's a bottom-up phenomenon. There's people watching each other, helping each other when possible, um, sometimes getting into a little trouble. Again, the mechanical labor. The, this is robotic labor and eventually leading us towards a future where we're creating machines that are not just servants but partners. Now remember we're talking over the course of a 50 year period. This is not something that's happening tomorrow. Um, and I would love to have a conversation at some point about what this really means, what the, how this could really manifest, but at, at its base level what this is saying is we increasingly have a capacity to make things that are smart, that add to our own intelligence, that allow us to do things we could never do before. These pieces, the signals are starting to come together. The pieces are coming into place. So we ask, what, what does this scenario look like in 50 years? This is actually the hardest one to describe because it would be so utterly different. Now we think about what the world looked like 50 years ago. So you think about the early 60s. And yeah, there were certainly some big changes. We didn't have anything approaching the internet and you know, you know, people would get in trouble for having hair just a little bit longer than this. Um, but people drove their cars to work. They lived in, in wood frame houses and brick buildings. And you could take someone from 1963, drop them into 2013, and they'd be very disoriented for a while, but they'd pick up on how the world works in fairly short order. You could take someone from 1913, drop them in today, and they'd be much more disoriented, but still, all of these pieces are in place. You know, all of the pieces of, of how our day-to-day -day lives operate today could be seen as early signals. And the kind of stuff I was talking about here for the next 50 years, as early signals in 1913. To get an understanding of what this world would feel like, you have to imagine what it would be like to take someone from 1813 and drop them into today. What it, would, what it would viscerally feel like to be surrounded by these noisy machines, to be surrounded by buildings that are far taller than anything you could, you could ever imagine having been built, be surrounded by people talking into their hands, to be surrounded by women in pants, um, to be surrounded by a world so utterly transformed that none of it makes sense. Yeah, sure, over the course of months and years, you may become accustomed. But for a very long time, probably for the rest of your, your life, you just simply won't quite get what the hell happened. And not just the, how did, how did I end up here? But just, what happened to the world? This is the kind of future, if we start thinking in terms of the ability to create any physical object by pulling the carbon from the atmosphere, probably making it out of diamond, actually. The, the ability to create machines that are as smart as us, to be able to work with them as partners, to basically get rid of the whole notion of day-to-day -day labor, because we have machines that can do that. To get away from the notion of scarcity for many, for many of our goods. To move towards a world where creativity and knowledge from wherever you are, no matter where you are in the world, has the potential to transform everything. That's the kind of future that is possible. Not guaranteed, but possible. This is a future, this is a world today that has many choices ahead of us. The kind of future that we create could very well be that kind of disaster doom scenario that I talked about at the beginning. That's still in our power, still in our hands. But one of the critical features of talking in terms of scenarios, one of the critical elements of talking in terms of different possible futures, rather than the single official future, is to emphasize the fact that we have choices, that the future is something that we create, not something that just happens to us. So you know, it started at the beginning at the, the future from the view of the present. Well, let's see the present as seen from the future. 
That was a picture taken by the Opportunity rover on Mars. So that literally is us. Here is an example, a wonderful example from recent years of the tools that we make giving us an entirely new, entirely transformative view of not just how the universe works, but who we are and where we are as a people. Everyone who has ever lived is in that pixel. I mean, Carl Sagan used to talk about the tiny blue dot. And this is it. This is this notion, this is the idea, the recognition that everything that we have is in that fragile little pixel. But we have the ability to make something that can see that dot in the sky. We have the ability to create something. Oh, this, the rover was supposed to have a three-month three lifespan. It's been going for about 10 years now. It's this incredible capacity to make things that do wondrous things, to change our society in ways that allow us to do wondrous things. The whole notion of foresight, the whole notion of future, futurism is to get away from the notion that we're locked into the future. We're locked into a single storyline. We're not. We have agency. We have power. We have the ability to create the future. And I hope I'm there, I'm there to help you with that. So thank you.